podcast from CBS Sports. High drive, center field, hit the wall, grand slam. This is magnificent. Got a fantasy question? Email fantasybaseball at cbsi.com. Get ready to win your league. Where fantasy becomes reality. Now here's Frank, Scott, Chris, and Adam. Howdy, everybody, and welcome into Fantasy Baseball Today. Frank Sample joined by Scott White and Chris Towers. The hashtag squad is all back together today on the show. It's kind of a light day of baseball, only seven games on Monday. We'll recap all of it. We've got some early season trends that we want to talk about and some trade candidates as well. But before we get to all that, guys, I am pumped. MLB The Show, back to Xbox releasing on we're recording this monday it's almost midnight actually in five minutes i could technically download it on my xbox so i'm pretty excited chris do you have any interest or you're just going to keep playing mvp baseball what is it oh five oh six yeah i i only i i only game on my computer at this point so um if they want to release one for pc i'm all i'm all here for it but until then i'm stuck with mvp baseball oh five and super mega baseball three it's not it, those aren't bad games to be stuck. Oh, with. they're amazing games. They're they're amazing games. You're right about that. R- really, they're not releasing the show on PC. I don't think so. No. Uh, <laughs> you're think, wearing like in my. I'm not very technically savvy or smart, but like my thought is like an Xbox is just like a computer. So just like how how difficult could it be? All right. Like what's the like? I don't know. I'm sure there's some good reason for it, but. It can't be that difficult. Just do like, it. Come on. Uh, that's a backhanded something or other. I don't know what the term is, but Chris, you are very clearly the most technologically savvy of the three of us here on this podcast. So if you're not a tech guy, then I don't know what we are because that, <laughs> it's it's not good. Uh, Scott, you are wearing an NES shirt, and um, I, I assume that you probably haven't played a baseball game since then. So <laughs> I have okay. since then, yes. Uh, but I think the last... Baseball game, I that wasn't a pure simulator. The last baseball game that I purchased new was uh, probably MLB The Show 06, maybe 07. The one I had David Wright on the cover. So we're talking talking a long time ago. Yeah. Talking a long time ago. I, Look, I, if, someone, if someone wants to send me an Xbox One or a PS5, <laughs> I'll, I'll get the show. Yeah. You know. well, I got, put, I got to put that point. out there in the world, you know? I got to a point where... With that version of the show I bought, I only ever simulated games. So it's like, this is stupid. You Why not just OTP? buy a simulator? That So Out of the Park became my go-to for a while. Then I got married and have kids. And who was the time for that, honestly? And there goes that. Yeah, David Wright. <laughs> it was MLB 07 The Show. So that was the last one. Scott 07. Frank. Okay. If anyone wants to hit me up on Xbox, tweet at me, uh, at Roto underscore Frank. Send me your username. We're a gamer tag. We'll, we'll figure something out. But let's jump right into the Oh My Goodness Gracious players from Monday. Oh my good, goodness gracious. Chris, you haven't been around for a while. Why don't you get us started here? Oh my goodness gracious. I was really hoping you weren't going to go to me because my mind just went blank on who I said I was going to do before the game, before the show. Lucas Giolito, I think. Yeah. Bad start for Lucas Giolito. Not sure what was up with that. It's It's, you know, it's not really... There's nothing there. There's no reason to worry about Lucas Giolito. Just a really, really, really awful start for him. Uh, threw 54 pitches, got five whiffs. He threw 54 pitches and re- recorded three outs. Um, that was a weird game. Tony Larissa decided to have Yermi and Mercedes pitch in the seventh inning of a game. <laughs> they were only down by six runs. Uh, so, yeah, not a great so- start for our guy, Lucas Giolito. But, you know, obviously. So I, no, I agree no, there's no nothing to worry about, but there actually may have been yeah. like a quasi explanation for it because it was it was the it was the one game of the year that starts at 11 a.m. Right. right. It's the only game. The Red Sox have a game on a Patriots Day, Patriots Day yeah. that starts at 11 a.m. So, you know, much earlier. I, I don't know what time you have to get up in the morning to be ready to pitch an 11 a.m. game. I I imagine it's pretty early um but anyway daryl daryl van schuen i'm gonna say that's how you pronounce his name he is 
a White Sox beat writer for the Chicago Sun Times, and he tweeted this out at, at right before 10 a.m. Lucas Giolito is one of those I'm not a morning person people. He's that guy in spring training, hair askew, eyes half shut, coffee in hand, walking through clubhouse at 8:30 a.m. Kind of funny. He's the one getting the ball for 11 a.m. start. He does have a 3.22 career ERA in day games. I just want to point that out. But that's yeah. usually two hours later. Yeah, I guess than what that two hours was. makes all the difference. I would think. It, it, yeah, two hours is a long time when you're talking about waking up. Go to sleep a little earlier, Lucas. <laughs> I can relate because look, we record this podcast every night around midnight. I I guess we have the option to wake up and record in the morning if we wanted to. But who wants to wake up at seven or eight a.m.? It's I mean, that's an Adam Azer thing. That's this fine. Is, this is, him, we're going to get so many angry emails from people about this discussion. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, the last thing I wanted to add about Lucas Giolito, no, you should not be worried about him. Uh, his ERA after the game was 5.79. StackCast has already factored in the start, and his expected ERA is 2.90. So do not freak out. I know it's rough because if you're playing a points league on CBS, he gave you negative 17 fantasy points. You hate to see it from your ace. Scott, oh my goodness gracious, for Monday. So I think I'm actually going to go with Danny Duffy here. Um, He was amazing. You stole my guy. Did I? No, nah, it's fine. Well, I, I, maybe I left because I was originally going to go with who's really your guy. So maybe I left him for you. Yeah, that's fine. I'm cool with it. Dan, Danny Duffy against the Rays. Six innings, zero earned runs. There were two unearned runs. Eight strikeouts, 18 whiffs. 10 on his fastball. Now his fastball wasn't quite as hard as last time out. It was, it was like he averaged 94.5 or so in that last outing. And that was about, that's as hard as he threw. Um, well, you have to go back to like 2016 to a time he threw that hard over a full season. And that was, yeah, he was borderline stud in fantasy back in those days. So it was, it was eye opening. It, it was down a mile per hour in this stat. It was 93.5, but that's still what he averaged uh, in like 2017, 2018. You're still going back to better days for Danny Duffy when he was throwing that hard. And like it's his fastball has been a really good pitch at times, a surprisingly high whiff rate for that pitch. And, you know, again, 10 of the 18 whiffs came on it. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe he's uh, rediscovered something because he's been pretty dominant so far and with the velocity going up and, and his history of being successful when his velocity is higher, I think it's to the point where might have to take a flyer on him. Somebody yeah. in your league could use him. And just for context, the 93.5 miles per hour he averaged with the fastball today was... His highest in a start since why well, send this in front of me. Last time uh, it was higher. Last time out it was higher. Right, right. So. But yeah, before the the most pre the most recent start before this one was uh, okay. August fifth, twenty eighteen. Okay. That's pretty encouraging stuff for Danny Duffy. So I mean Scott, he's sixty eight percent roster. I assume a lot of people picked him up for a two start week. So if you did that, you probably just want to hold on to him because again, yeah, there's a lot to buy into here with Duffy between the whiffs and, and the added velocity on his fastball but how far are you moving him up how much are you actually buying into this because you have him currently as your 92nd starting pitcher i have him 95th so we clearly weren't buying in but i i guess we have more reason to do so now yeah i was intrigued after the last one but you know with with each passing start where he exceeds your expectations then obviously you got to move him up a little more um i don't know i got i have to look and see what See who I need to move him ahead of here. So yes. you have you have Marco Gonzalez at 66, Dallas Keuchel at 65. So are we thinking that many spots, like 25 to 30 spots for Duffy? I mean, potentially. There's a lot of there's a lot of maneuverability in that range of starting pitchers. Yep, uh, guys can move up and down pretty freely, and it's really kind of a start by start basis thing, particularly this time of year. Um. Yeah, I'd have to. Sorry, I had I opened it initially, and it was my AL only ranking, so it showed up much higher than. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'll, that's something I'll have to look at when I do the rankings tomorrow. Well, if you are, if Danny Duffy is available in your league, you, I think you should take a shot on him. He has a two star week this week. 
but he is slated to face the Minnesota Twins in Minnesota next week, which is a meh matchup. So we'll see how yeah. his second start goes later this week. I can see him being in the top 70 for sure. All right. Right so on the here. print that, you know, I got like Drew Smiley in that range, Marco Gonzalez, Griffin. Yeah, here, here's I, I think he belongs I, in that range. Here's one I just saw. What about him versus Dylan Cease? Yeah, I'd rather have Duffy for sure. I would take the shot on Duffy the way he's pitching right now. Cease has yet to go five innings in a start. I agree. So. Yeah. All righty. So we are, it seems like we are, at least for now, buying in on Danny Duffy. We'll, we'll see if he, he turns back into um, Danny Duffy at some point. Hopefully not. Uh, let's highlight Joe Musgrove, who is currently pitching right now on the West Coast in San Diego. And he's probably going to come out for another inning, I would assume. But through six, he has 11 strikeouts. He has allowed three hits. Two of those are solo home runs. But Joe Musgrove, once again, using his breaking pitches a ton. Pretty much every start he's had with the Padres thus far, of course, through a no-hitter with them earlier in the season. 23 whiffs on 82 pitches. Look, this is not a great Brewers lineup. I, I get it. Christian Yelich out of the lineup. It's it's a very pedestrian lineup, and that's probably giving it too much credit. But, man, throwing his slider 28% of the time, cutter 24%, curveball 22 That's exactly what we see in every start. Those three pitches being his main pitches and using his fastball less than ever before. And this is something I think that's being influenced by you, Darvish, and Victor Caratini as his catcher, and I've highlighted that before. It might be happening, guys. It might actually be happening for Joe Musgrove. Anything you'd like to add? Yeah. I mean, the whiff rate has slowed down a little from where it was earlier, but for a while it looked like he was going to have the the highest whiff total of any pitcher so far this season, which is pretty amazing when you consider how consistently high Jacob deGrom's are. And even now, 23. I mean, that's going to put him in the running on 82 pitches. Yeah, I mean, this might be... I know nobody likes to nobody likes the the next Shane Bieber comparison, but I feel like I feel like Musgrove has a lot going for him if we're if we're making Shane Bieber comps. Now I could get behind that, Scott. The next Shane Bieber. Not there yet, but I uh, mean the the thing you the the thing is there has never been at any point in Joe Musgrove's career a stretch of three or four starts where he's looked really good. And then struggled afterwards. So I think you got to anoint him now. That's sarcasm if you don't. No, it. no, no, no. <laughs> oh, Chris, why? Why must you crush my soul? The souls of <laughs> I mean, it's just like, you know, any Joe Musker of managers. We're, we're riding roller coasters here. There early wasn't in a no season, hitter. Sometimes. There wasn't a 23 with outing. Come on. I this mean, is, this is different. Chris, I would agree with you. Anyone if, can throw a no hitter. Mm, well, I guess theoretically that is a factual statement, but not many people do do it. Um, he's made Whatever. tangible changes. That's that, you know that's no, the big I agree. Joe Musgrove. So it's I'm you just know, I'm I'm just being a wet blanket. Uh, I have him currently inside of my top thirty starting pitchers. I don't know that there's anything else we need to add about that outside of it might actually be happening for Joe Musgrove. Quickly promote. What does a World Series winning executive do after running a Major League Baseball team for 18 years? They start a podcast. David Sampson hosts Nothing Personal with David Sampson, a daily podcast dedicated to giving you the truth about sports, business, and entertainment. Step inside the front office and really get to know sports. Nothing Personal with David Sampson is available every weekday wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember... It's just business. It's nothing personal. Some news and notes. Starling Marte will be placed on the 10-day IL after an MRI revealed a fractured rib. He'll be reevaluated in five to seven days. So hopefully this is not a long-term thing. Starling Marte was off to a fantastic start with the Miami Marlins as well. Uh, an offense that is about to get a lot worse. So if you're streaming your starting pitchers against them, sorry, Chris. Denelson Lamet will make his... <laughs> Nelson Lamet will make his season debut on either Tuesday or Wednesday against the Milwaukee Brewers. It's a pretty good lineup to make your season debut against. Obviously, Denelson Lamet dealing with the right biceps injury last year, which actually turned out to be an elbow injury on the same arm that he's had Tommy John surgery. So we're closely monitoring that situation, but he was awesome last year. Again, the name Denelson Lamet. Ronald Acuna is considered day to day after an MRI revealed a mild abdominal strain. You can, I believe, still bench him because he hasn't played yet. The Braves will play the Yankees on Tuesday. Would you guys actually bench Acuna knowing this information? 
I think in a shallower league, if I had a pretty good alternative, I'd play it safe and bench him because day to day could mean five days, you know? It yeah. Mean I mean, the whole week. We've seen, so I think Anthony Rendon was day to day for four days in a row until he went on the IL. You know, that's the kind of, maybe it wasn't him, but there was someone yelling like that reason. Yeah. Yeah. That, that happens all the time where like you miss three or four days and then they're just like, we might as well just take six extra days. Yeah. It's, uh, it's going to be tough to do it in a roto league with five outfielders, but yeah, maybe in a points league, you, you yeah. might have enough good options to uh, to get Ronald Acuna on your bench if you are worried about that. But pay attention to see if he's in the Braves lineup on Tuesday. The Twins' latest round of COVID tests all came back negative, so it looks like their scheduled double double header with the A's on Tuesday will be good to go. Nick Castellanos' appeal for his two game suspension has been denied. He will miss Tuesday and Wednesday against the D-backs. You know what that means, Scott? It's Tyler Naquin time. That's true. That's <laughs> true. More reason to hold on to him. Wonderful. I, <laughs> I just want a resolution to the Tyler Naquin saga. All right? I, mean, I, Is, I think we have a resolution to the Tyler Naquin saga. Not when he's back to playing again and he just hit a, another homer. and I don't know. I, I wish I wish I had your level of assurance, I guess. But just it's Tyler Naquin. Yeah, I feel like this is a problem that's going to solve itself. Yeah. If given enough time. I, I would say the odds are heavily in its favor. The stat cast page is it looks pretty nice. Of course, it's whatever, 20, 25 batted balls, so it's Take it with a grain of salt. And like the little thing with all the sliders on Statcast, like it, you know, I like to look at it. It's very pretty when it's got a bunch of red, but like of the like 11 things that it shows, like seven of them are all like related to batted ball exit velocity somehow. So, like, you know, yeah, if you hit the ball, a lot, hard, of, double, a lot of double counting going on is what I'm saying. Right. Mm. For the Astros, Alex Bregman, Jordan Alvarez, and Martin Maldonado, and Robel Garcia are tentatively expected to rejoin. The Astros on Tuesday in Colorado. Jose Altuve was not mentioned, so perhaps he needs more time. Jordan Alvarez, I just I realized this today. He probably will not play because they are in a National League park in Coors Field, unless they want to throw him at first base or outfield. But I feel like the Astros are not going to do that. So don't start Jordan Alvarez unless he's in the lineup. Lance McCullers will not make his scheduled start on Tuesday against the Rockies as he's dealing with a non-COVID related illness. The Phillies are dealing with a COVID situation of their own. Three players, Jose Alvarado, Matt Moore, and Ronald Reyes, were placed on the COVID IL. Five coaches were also placed in the protocol. Didi Gregorius was held out of the lineup on Monday, not COVID-related. He is dealing with an elbow issue. Colton Wong dealing with that oblique strain. He's on the IL as of now. He's expected to be activated this upcoming weekend against the Chicago Cubs. Adalberto Mondesi still has yet to be cleared to swing a bat, he's dealing with an oblique strain. Spoke about this last week, Scott, about the he's, he might be wiggling his toes. We don't know what's going on. They said he's making <laughs> movement, but apparently not enough movement to swing. There's it. some movement. We Is see that a some Kill movement. Bill reference. That is yeah, exactly what it was. Another movie oh, that yeah, I haven't okay. seen, Chris. So uh, add it to the list. Come on, man. <laughs> Yankees GM Brian Cashman said Luke Voigt is expected back around mid-May. He's returning from surgery to repair a partially torn meniscus. Padres manager Jace Tingler said that Austin Nola, who is returning from a fractured finger, should resume playing in games at the team's alternate training site in the next, quote, two or three days. So maybe we see Austin Nola back within the next week or so. Spencer Turnbull will make his season debut for the Tigers against the Pirates this Wednesday. He was in the COVID protocols to this point in the season. He is 11% rostered. Any interest in the Bull? Spencer Turnbull. I don't. I can't imagine a league where I'm so desperate for a starting pitcher that I'm picking up Spencer Turnbull. I guess an AL only league, but yeah, no, I I don't think the upside's particularly high. And um, yeah, it's it's kind of a kind of a crowded situation. Wow, no love for the 3.97 ERA, 1.34 WHIP from Spencer Turnbull last year. <laughs> Tough crowd here. Uh, no, but I actually agree. AL only, you should look at him. Maybe in some deeper roto leagues, but outside of that, Turnbull getting ready to return. Email of the day. This one's from Chris in Indianapolis. On yesterday's podcast, Scott mentioned that he wouldn't make the same ridiculous promise that Frank did when he ate his hat. 
but I seem to remember one Scott White being so certain that Hyunjin Ryu would end the year with a sub 4.16 ERA this year that he would eat his hat if that didn't happen. Normally, we could let that slide, but after the lecture Scott gave Frank for his hyperbolic promise, I say it's time for accountability. I think it's important Scott gets a taste of his own medicine, a medicine made by New Era or 5950 Pharmaceuticals. I think Chris in Indianapolis needs to get his ears checked because that's not what I said. I said that I'm sure at some point I made the same claim that I would eat my hat, but I didn't do it for something that had such a short timetable that anybody remembered it when the time came, you know? Oh, no, oh okay. Nobody so could broken follow promises, and up. Broken promises don't count as long as, you know, people forget about them. Yeah, exactly. well, Bon appetit, Scotty. Maybe Ryu is going to age very rapidly this year and have an ERA over four. I would be shocked if his ERA said I. I would eat my hat if Yunjin Ryu has a 416 <laughs> ERA. How about that? I will, I will ship you this hat, Scott, and you can eat it live on the air. <laughs> Did I you actually like actually eat any of it? Well, no, I, I started off the podcast yesterday. Thanks for listening and watching, Chris. No, uh, I listened. I just you know, no, I didn't. I, you know, I started the podcast mumbling because I had a hat in my mouth, and somebody pointed out on Twitter that I should have to eat some kind of nasty candy out of my well, hat for an I'm entire just thinking podcast. Like, yeah, you gotta. No, I just think you cut a swatch off and swallow it. Well, I, no. I, I really like this hat. So I, then you shouldn't have made the bet. <laughs> it's just right. an expression, for goodness sakes. No, he meant it literally. <laughs> <laughs> so Scott, if uh, if Ryu winds up with an ERA over four point one six, uh, I'll ship you whatever hat I was talking about. Apparently, I don't think it's going to happen. He's he's been awesome anyway. Do you have any interest in these waiver candidates from Monday night? There, I mean, honestly, these are names only in the deepest leagues. But hey, it, there's only seven games going on, so we have to talk about what's happening. Austin Slater, I saw you pumping him up on Twitter, Scott. He went two for four with his second steal of the season last year in only thirty one games. Austin Slater had a two eighty two batting average with five homers. In eight steals, he has started four of the last five games for San Francisco. He is 12% rostered. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really impressive numbers last year before he got hurt. He reached base at a 408 clip, had five homers, eight steals in 104 plate appearances, and was doing similar things this spring. Uh, so, you know, I, I kind of hoped they would figure out a way to get him at bats against righties. It seems like. They're just kind of done with Mauricio Dubon and are going with and are going with Slater in center field, even against righties. So his strikeout rate during the regular season, since it switched from spring to the regular season, it's way too high. And obviously, if he keeps striking out at a 35% clip, you know, that's going to keep him from making a real impact. But I like the on base skills. I like the power. I like the speed. I think there may be something here. He's only 12% rostered. Um I think if I think if you're chasing upside and he's somebody to look into. Five outfielder leagues, 15 team roto, something we talk about often. Not that many people listening to this podcast play in those formats, but if you do, if you're in a deeper league, uh, also no, I don't I don't even know that you have to be in anything that deep. I think if you if you want a steals like if you're in a categories league, you want steals but not from like a one category specialist that's going to be really hard to get in your lineup in a shallow league. You're just chasing upside, you know, you're just chasing upside. I, I, I could see dropping just kind of a boring outfielder for a 12 team league for Slater. I could see doing that. AJ Pollock. I bring up his name every time. I feel like he's the face of boring outfielders. Yeah. Yeah. I do. Sure. So, and all, Somebody mentioned Aaron Hicks. Now, rest of season, I'm going to predict Aaron Hicks will have better numbers than Austin Slater, but it's a it's a chasing upside kind of move. The Yankees stink, man. I, oh, just, I don't want to talk about them. I mean, I will say, like, <laughs> you know, there are there are things to like about Austin Slater. I think I have him in, in one league. When you compare him to AJ Pollock, like, let's be more fair to AJ Pollock, who was really good last season. He was great last year. He's done nothing. Yeah, I mean, he's in been a like, way that did not seem. Austin Slater would kill to have an 800 OPS in four straight seasons, 780, right. 795 it's, and one. It's about assurance versus upside. Is but isn't, the, is the argument? 
That was probably 150 right. games total for Pollock in that four game span, Chris. I I'm, just like, I, I don't know. Like, this is a classic mystery box versus a boat thing, and it doesn't really matter. Yeah, no, I, I think there are valuable, but like, chances where it makes they, sense to go. Right, right. right. I'm just saying that. Austin Slater is getting upside grafted onto him mostly because he hasn't played in the majors in that time. Well, the the little bit he has played has been really good, and he's right. But AJ Pollock was better last year. <laughs> sure, but was, just, that's why I just want to like I just want to properly caliber. I just want to make sure we're properly calibrating these things, and like okay. I thought I did. I thought I did a good job of explaining it. Maybe I didn't. Apparently, Chris from Indianapolis heard something completely different from what I said yesterday and re with regard to the eating your hat comment. I so. actually, I misspelled Brooklyn. That was an autocorrect thing. I wonder if Slater was, was better on frequent basis, but we've been talking about Austin Slater for way too long anyway. Um, a few other names here, some hitters in deeper formats. Do, do they matter? Justin Williams went two for three with a home run and a walk for the St. Louis Cardinals. In his minor league career, he was a 296 hitter with a 778 OPS. Luis Arias I mentioned Joe Musgrove gave up two home runs. One of them was to Arias in his return to San Diego, the revenge game. Arias does have exactly one hit in five of his last six games, which includes two home runs. And he is playing every day now. He's 13% rostered on CBS. Adolis Garcia from the Texas Rangers had, he currently has two hits. And including a double and a home run off of Dylan Bundy. He's an outfielder from Cuba. He's been with the Rangers since December 2019. And back in 2019 in the PCL, he had 32 home runs and, th and 13 steals. So maybe there's something there. Garcia, Arias, Justin Williams, Chris. Anything? Deeper leagues? I mean, I've always had a thing for Arias. I don't really... Like, he hit a home run today um, off Joe Musgrove and then for some re reason was pulled from the game in like the fifth inning. I'm not sure if it was just, I think it was a defensive replacement. So that's not a great sign. Um, it's not great. I, I, I think the likelihood of any of these guys mattering much for fantasy is pretty low. I think like Garcia, because he doesn't have, you know, the, the track record to fall back on, maybe you can kind of look at him and dream a little bit, but um, his batted ball data isn't necessarily terribly impressive even though he has been hitting well. Luis Arias was removed from Monday's game with a right calf cramp. So oh, okay. There goes that. A few pitchers that were on the mound on Monday who are rostered in less than 35% of CBS leagues. Kohei Arihara was at the Angels 5 and 2 thirds shutout, two hits, two walks, six strikeouts, seven whiffs on 77 pitches. He has allowed zero runs over his last two starts. And if StatCast is correct, Arihara threw seven different types of pitches in this start against the Angels. Uh, Josh Fleming, the other name that I noticed, was at the Royals. Five and one-third shutout, two hits, zero walks, three strikeouts, pitches to contact, not going to get a lot of strikeouts. 34% rostered. Scott, any interest in Arihara or Josh Fleming? No, I, I feel like I feel like the upside's pretty limited for both. Like I could see Arihara being just kind of a a stable streamer guy. Um Marco Gonzalez type. Yeah, if if he can go seven plus with yeah. the consistency Marco Gonzalez uh is known to do, hasn't so much this year because he's been getting pummeled, but is known to do. Um then I think Arihara maybe maybe could be that kind of pitcher, but he hasn't been given that kind of leash yet so we'll see i mean it, obviously he comes with a bit of a track record from japan not really as a bat misser and he hasn't shown that kind of ability over here either but when you have that many pitches to work with it just seems like probably going to be pretty good at keeping hitters off balance and um he should throw a lot of strikes which also helps so i i don't think i'll be useless i just think it'll be kind of boring Again, the name there, Kohei Arihara with the Texas Rangers. We're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we have early season trends that we'll talk about here on Fantasy Baseball Today. Let's start things off with the league batting average, which currently sits at 233. It's absolutely brutal. Uh, I guess that is lowered by the 286 Babbitt thus far batting average on balls in play, which is currently the lowest since 1992. And speaking of batting average, it was I mentioned 233. 
The lowest ever was 237 back in 1968. Strikeouts are up a tad this year as well to 24.6%. Chris, any takeaways with this? I know you mentioned before we started, you know, BABIP is always lower in April. So hopefully we see some regression here. But with a strikeout rate that high, you know, it, I feel like it might make guys like DJ LeMahieu once he gets going and, and Alex Verdugo and Michael Brantley, it will make them even more valuable because their batting average will, will stick out even more so if, if the league batting average is this low. Yeah, I mean, you would think so. It, it obviously depends on, you know, how whether and how they're affected by the, this kind of change. But yeah, I, I think you would assume a guy with a high batting average could have even more value. And conversely, a guy with an especially low batting average might hurt you a little less. Um, you know, this is um, strikeout rate continues to go up. And that, I think that's the biggest thing is that even if you take out pitchers the strikeout rate has gone up again this year so you know obviously pitchers weren't hitting last year so you think the numbers might be skewed the non-pitcher strikeout rate this year is 24 percent. that would be the the highest ever even including pitchers and so i i think what we're seeing and i think the early returns on the new baseball are that it comes off the bat higher harder or at a higher velocity and you're seeing that with a 0.06 uh, leap in average exit velocity from last season. And the ball does not travel as far. But I believe, yeah, through April 14th, the home run to fly ball ratio, I'm looking at a story from Rob Arthur on Day Baseball Prospectus today. Through April 14th, the home run to fly ball ratio is almost a dead match for 2019. And with warmer weather in the latter half of the month, that should produce even more round trippers. And obviously there's more that goes into it just besides just the ball itself, weather plays a big factor, and it's possible that there could be some kind of weather pattern around the country that has created these conditions in a way that it wasn't there in 2019. I don't know. I'm not smart enough to know that. Um, <laughs> but it does seem like the, the long and short of it is the early season trends indicate that we're seeing a more extreme version of the very extreme version of baseball that we've seen the last couple of years. Some more strikeouts. Uh, lower batting averages, fewer balls in play, um, and you know, home run rates that should still be fairly high. One thing I've wondered about is one effect that the kind of the the loosening of the stitching on the new ball has is, is that it raises the seam height. Because remember when the ball changed. Um, mm -hmm. They, the pitchers talked about how it was slicker and felt like an ice cube and and they had an adjustment there. With the seams being higher and, and being, I, I presume that would mean easier to grip. Are they able to manipulate the ball more, thus creating the big jump in strikeout? I mean, strikeout rates have been going up for a while, but it, it's up significantly this year. Maybe that's kind of an April thing too, but... No, that it's actually spring... Spring training strikeout rates league-wide actually tend to be very predictive, and the strikeout rate was about 25% this spring. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's that's just – I think this is real. There. Yeah. Yep. So, I, I mean, if you got players selling out with the fly balls for home runs, you know, uh, and, and you got a higher strikeout rate, the batting average might be – I don't know. This might be something that – that lingers. Uh, I t we talked about this yesterday, Frank, that like, I feel like my teams that are doing well offensively just happen to have hit a lot of home runs so far. Not necessarily even they have a bunch of home run hitters. They just happen to have hit a bunch of home runs and like how much, how much more offense this year is going to come from home runs, which yeah. Chris was saying it, it being uh, going even more the way of a three true outcomes game that, that kind of fits into that as well. Yeah, the one question that I have that I, I don't think I've seen a good answer for is whether this ball, like you mentioned, does have more drag. Um, because one of the things that um, in this Rob Arthur article, which if you have a baseball prospectus uh, subscription, you should check out, is a lighter ball could look as if it has more drag because it wouldn't carry as far. And it it is possible. MLB did say they were lightening the ball slightly. Um, mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of things at play that we still don't have great answers to, but you know, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is maybe there is more drag on the ball. Maybe for some reason there's more 
you know, the impact of the spin would create more drag based on certain factors. Maybe it's because it is lighter. Maybe the seams are higher, whatever the case may be. That could lead to more movement on pitches, which I think we've seen early on. I think there's been uh, some league-wide trends of increased movement on various pitch types. And also, and this is just my kind of personal theory. I don't actually have any evidence for this, and I don't think there would be any way to check whether this is accurate. But if someone does know, um, stolen base percentage is higher than it's ever been so far this season. And obviously, we're dealing with small sample sizes, but it's 77.4%, something like that. And it's usually 70 to 72%. I think last year was 73. The previous high is like 75. Um, so that could be a result of the, the changed ball as well. Maybe catchers are having a harder time throwing accurately. I don't know. That's That's kind of a theory that I've been kicking around. I have no idea how to test it, but... If that trend does continue, maybe we'll we will see, uh, you know, more stolen bases eventually. Well, I'm I'm thinking of it the other way, Chris, because if that regresses closer to where it's been recently, then we're going to get even less deals. And right, I looked this up before we started here, and so far this season, we are getting one stolen base every eighty-two point seven plate appearances. Back in 2019, that was one stolen base every 81.8 plate appearances. So obviously, you want that number to be lower, so so stolen bases happen more frequently. But that, but that was, would also, you know, yeah, that was one of the lowest, you know, seasons in terms of steals over the course of a full 162 game season, I think, ever. But so, that would also be related to like the lower league wide OBP. Um, sure. There's another piece on Baseball Prospectus. I'm giving them a lot of shout outs today. Uh, there have been 5,768 opportunities to steal through Saturday's games, although that sounds like a lot. Remember that an opportunity is defined simply as whether a player is on first or second with a base open ahead of them. Um, the league-wide rate on stolen bases is 4.3%. Um, so that's it's not like start, startlingly lower or higher than usual. Um, so I don't know. I'm not sure what the, if, there, if there's that much there yet. But yeah, it's a question of whether that stolen league-wide stolen base rate does regress or not. And historically, it's not that's not something that has gone down. It's not like April usually has higher stolen base rates. It's usually pretty steady. And I just want to go back to the power for a second and highlight a few players who have a fly ball rate over 50%, yet they're home run to fly ball ratio is below 10%. So if if you assume that it's going to regress towards league average, then league average is usually, what, 10 to 12%, I think, in terms of home run to fly ball ratio? 14% uh, the last few years. Okay, so yeah, it's gone up even more. A few names, uh, Randall Grichuk, he has a 5% home run to fly ball ratio. He's actually hitting the ball really hard again this year. Brendan Lau, so we'd like to see him get going. He has a 50% fly ball rate a 6.3% home run to fly ball ratio. Jock Peterson, another one to 6.7% home run to fly ball rate. Uh, Didi Gregorius, he's 9.1. Ryan Mountcastle, 4.5%, especially in Camden Yards. I could see him one where the power does come around for Ryan Mountcastle. And those are the main names. Mike Moustak is at 11.8%, so that's probably going to go up as the weather heats up a little bit in Cincinnati. I think your point about the weather, Chris, is a good one because obviously the ball flies better as the season goes on because the weather heats up a little bit. So hopefully a few of those names uh, who are off to slow starts start to hit for some more power. Now going back to steals, just wanted to highlight a few players that uh, had three plus steals entering Monday night. There were 19 players who have hit that threshold, three or more steals, and a few you might not expect thus far. Andrew Benintendi, Jerkson Profar, Max Kepler, Miguel Rojas, they each have three. Manny Machado and Eddie Rosario each have four. Really like to see that from Manny Machado this early in the season. Jace Tingler and the San Diego Padres, they love to run. Uh, and so far, Manny Machado is doing just that. Javier Baez, we haven't talked about this. He has five steals in 15 games. His career high was 21 back in 2018, and that was in 160 games. So obviously, he's pacing well over that and uh, no, I don't think he's going to steal whatever 50 or 60 bases, whatever he's on pace for. But I think this is a really good sign. Javier Baez playing for a contract and the past couple of years, he's been caught stealing more and you know, he's, he was kind of, he was slowing down. He wasn't running as much, but I, I think if you have Baez in a roto league, you feel really good about that steal total this early. 
It's the one thing you feel okay about. <laughs> and just, yeah, to highlight that, like, he's got five steal attempts on 16 stolen base opportunities because he's been on base so infrequently, whereas Manny Machado has five attempts on 34 opportunities. So just to highlight how often Baez is running right now. Uh, the K rate, K per nine so far, 9.4 K per nine for all pitchers this year, which makes sense. We've highlighted that strikeouts are up in general. Uh, that is 9.2 for only starting pitchers. So, uh, you know, I'm sure it's helped out by Shane Bieber and Jacob DeGrom and these aces. And that was something we kind of suspected towards the end of spring training that the aces might be even better than they usually are. And so far, I think that's been the case, uh, just furthering themselves away from the pack. Uh, all right, so that, that's it that, we, that I have for some league-wide trends. I did want to hit some trade targets. We have the rest of Monday's action. I'll give you a, an update on the West Coast. Someone emailed in asking for more Dynasty content, considering it's such a light day of action. I, I figured we could start there, Scott. So one player that you're looking to buy, one that you are looking to sell in a Dynasty setting right now. So I was kind of thinking along the lines of buying low and selling high. Um, I think that I, I have trouble usually, I have more trouble with the sell high usually because, uh, I, I think the obvious ones are obvious, but one that I think you could successfully sell high on is Aaron Savale, who is young enough and hyped enough that, you know, a lot of people are going to look at what his numbers look like right now. Three great starts, ERA very low. Um, and, and think he's a budding ace or something close to it. I'm still highly skeptical because of all the talk of him reinventing himself this spring, shorter, shorter arm action, a uh, new kind of cut change up, right? Um, the numbers under the hood don't really look all that different. He's still not getting a lot of whiffs. He's still not getting a lot of ground balls. He's still vulnerable in enough areas that I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical ERA is going to remain a plus for him. I think he'll be useful, but I don't think he'll be anywhere in, in the discussion of a stud. So he, he seems like a good sell high right now. Was that Zach Plezak? No, that was Aaron Savale. Was, was, were you... Chris has this devious look on his face right now. Well, He's sorry, saying. I did get distracted and because Albert Pujols stole a base, so maybe there is something happening right now. <laughs> Albert Pujols just stole a base. <laughs> but yes, I was making, I was being jocular. Jocular. Fair enough. Um, I mean, there's so many guys you could call by low candidates. Trevor's story strikes me as one that you could be successful with because there's concern of him leaving Colorado and he's done basically nothing this year. So maybe you could pry him away for 75 cents on a dollar. I think it'll be worth that. Kind of a, a buy high I was looking at, though, was Jared Walsh, who's not as young as you might think he is. He's 28 years old, but. It's It's been so encouraging to see him pick up where he left off last September. The strikeout rate way down. The power production's still been there. Um, he hasn't he hasn't been somebody they've needed to sit against lefties. So I, I think Jared Walsh is somebody I'd want to invest in in dynasty leagues at this point. I'm not saying you should... Um, pay out the nose for him or anything, but I think there's enough lingering skepticism about him that you might be able to get him particularly in a, in a long-term focused league like that for, for an okay price. I, I like that concept too, Scott, because I think there's, you know, there's a lot of people who play dynasty and everyone's always trying to get younger and they're not necessarily looking for a, not middling aged person, but you know, whatever Jared Walsh is 27 years old. So, I mean, he might just be entering his prime. This is the first opportunity he's had to really play every single day, and he's crushing it. Another name that comes to mind, if people are not buying in on the small sample size, it might be a buy high. It might turn out that he's a stud for the next couple of years. Your mean Mercedes, the Yerminator. <laughs> so far this year, he's been awesome. Four home runs, 415 batting average. And obviously, we're not expecting him to keep that up, but I just watching him play, the guy seems like a professional hitter, and I I think there's a chance that he actually might be able to stick around. So they have th things to figure out with Eloy Jimenez. Once he comes back, I don't think he's going to be a good fielder. Andrew Vaughn, obviously, they still have very high hopes for him after drafting him as, as high as they did. But 
I think Mercedes kind of fits that same mold as Jared Walsh as a, he's not young, he's not old, but he might be really good and you can get him at a cheaper price in a dynasty or keeper league. Chris, a player that you are looking to, one player that you're looking to buy, one player that you're looking to sell right now. So I'll start with the player I'm looking to sell, and that would be Roman Loriano, who uh, hates stolen bases so far. It's been an incredible start. It's been really, really nice for my Tout Wars team, the uh, the one league where I think I have him. Uh, he has eight stolen bases. He's only been caught once. Uh, that there again, there was a piece on Baseball Prospectus talking about. Uh, it's called Need for Speed, and it's from Darius Austin and. Uh, he went through and looked at all of Ramon Loriano's stolen base attempts and no throw was made on half of the stolen bases. Two of them were completely uncontested. One was they, they were both in like games where the A's were trailing by, by enough runs late. That the defense didn't seem to be too concerned about that. So I, I'm not necessarily thinking Ramon Loriano is going to lead the majors in stolen bases. So I, I would be looking to sell eye on him. Um, but, you know, not a, a not a must sell because I think he can still be a 2020 guy. Fair enough. A uh, player that you were looking to buy? Chris Bryant. Um, I, I get the feeling that the other two people on this podcast are probably pretty skeptical about his slow start or about his hot start. And I would guess most people uh, in fantasy baseball are. But I pretty much believe in it you know i think like his stack has numbers don't don't jump off the page well they never have um but they look better than they have in a while granted there's you know his ex web was 366 that's his best since 2017 obviously given the new ball i don't know if ex web has been properly calibrated yet to the new environment but um he's still hitting better so far than I think most people expect it, and I think a lot of people think he's a sell high candidate. I would say he's a buy high candidate. So far, yeah, I don't, I don't have, I don't have the concerns about Bryant that I did coming into the season anymore. He's, he just, it looks like he's bouncing back fine. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know that I'd be looking to sell high on him if I had him. I don't have him anywhere, <laughs> for what it's worth. But yeah, I want to be looking to sell him. Yeah, look, I'm I'm always going to be willing to admit when I was wrong about someone. And, and so far, I mean, Chris Bryant has made me look like a fool. He's batting 265 with five home runs and an OPS over 1,000. He's hitting a lot of fly balls. So especially once the weather heats up in Wrigley, that's something that can only help someone like Chris Bryant. And again, it's been 37 batted balls, but so far the returns, according to StatCast, have been much better than they have been in a long time. So if he keeps this up... Part of my concern was, can he stay healthy? But I believe it's a contract year. Does that sound right for Chris Bryant? Um, so, look, this happens all the time. It was part of the reason I like Correa as well, where guys in a contract year, they just somehow manage to stay healthy all of a sudden. So if Chris Bryant can do that, then, yeah, you might actually be, be onto something here. So I am going to be following this closely. Um, but, yeah, willing to admit that I was wrong so far. A player that I'm looking to buy, Charlie Morton, who... Has a 4.76 ERA, but under the hood, a 2.97 XFIP, a 3.13 Sierra, and all the skill indicators, 12.7% swinging strike rate. Basically, everything's in line with where he was in 2019 when he was a top 10 starting pitcher for bo both Roto and for head-to-head -head points. I don't currently rank him as a top 10 starting pitcher, but I'm saying there is a good chance that he can get back to that level. He's getting a ton of ground balls, a lot of whiffs, a lot of strikeouts. The velocity for Charlie Morton, 94.3 miles per hour on the fastball. Where was that back in 2019? 94.4. So Charlie Morton has, I think, bounced back. And I don't really have many concerns over him. If anyone is concerned at all about his surface numbers, I would definitely be looking to buy Charlie Morton. A few names that you might be able to offer straight up. We'll talk about him in a little bit. But Kevin Gosman, maybe a bit of a, a sell-high situation right now. Marcus Stroman, we spoke about yesterday, Scott. This is an interesting one. Would you guys trade away Trevor Rogers for Charlie Morton if you could right now? I'd rather have Morton. Scott? As much as I like Rogers. Yeah, I agree. I'd you rather might have be, Morton. You might be able to pull it off the way that Rogers has pitched thus far. Carlos Rodon was another name. Michael Pineda. Mitch Hanniger. As much as I love the guy and I'm rooting for him, I hope he just stays awesome all season long. 
He has dealt with a lot of injuries as well, and he's um, he's older than you would think. So I think he's just a classic sell high situation right now if you can get someone like Charlie Morton in return for Mitch Hanniger. And in that same regard, Justin Turner is the player that I would be looking to sell high. Yep. Don't just sell for the sake of selling him. I think he, is there a chance he could be a top 10 third baseman when he's on the field this year? For sure. No doubt about it. He's one, one of the best lineups in baseball, and that's without Cody Bellinger right now. Justin Turner looks revitalized. He's in great shape. Saw them comparing some side by side. He's like slimmed down or whatever. So good for him. If you can sell him for someone that we expected to be a top 10 at a position that you need coming into the season, sure, a top 20 outfielder, a top 25, top 30 starting pitcher, I would try to do something like that for Justin Turner right now. You might have wound, yep. wound up with him as a bench bat coming into the season. He might be expensive he's, for your team. He's the number three hitter in points leagues right now behind Acuna and J.D. Martinez. So, I, I mean, obviously at his age, as much as he sits out, that's not going to last. You know, he's hitting over 400. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I, if you can sell Justin Turner like a stud, I, I think you should because it's going to be difficult for him to live up to that over the course of a full season. I, I do have an update here from the late games. Kendall Graveman is in for the Mariners in the seventh inning. Yikes. <laughs> Well, this is the biggest spot in the game, right? Yeah. It was first and second in a one-run game with mm -hmm. one out at, at the time, and he actually, mm -hmm. oddly enough, just struck out Justin Turner. So he's currently yeah. facing Will Smith. Biggest spot in the game. It looks like uh, Kendall Graveman is, is that guy right now for them. And the Rangers and Angels are in a close game. Ian Kennedy is in for the save in the bottom of the night. So if anything happens there, we will update you on that. How about the rest of Monday's action? Tim Anderson recently returned from his hamstring injury. He went three for four with two steals and two runs scored on Monday. Really one of the only bright spots for the Chicago White Sox. Nathan Avaldi. the final line doesn't look good, but six and a third, nine hits, four earned, zero walks, 10 strikeouts, 19 whiffs for Avaldi on 100 pitches. He had a 14% swinging strike rate entering Monday's start. He threw five different pitches at least 12 times in this game against the White Sox. And I'm kind of excited about Nathan Ovaldi. I, I think he just might be a bona fide top 50 starting pitcher as long as he could stay healthy. He looks really good. He does, yeah. I, I mean, this was his... The 19 whiffs were the most he's had this season, but he entered with a 14% swinging strike rate, which would is elite. On its on its own, it's only gone up. Obviously, yeah. Really, the the fact he has both a curveball and slider now, when he didn't really have a breaking ball, like they, they're both they're both been effective. He threw that that was the second and third most thrown pitch in this start, and he's pairing them up, and it's it's making it's making that that um you know just pure heat that he has more effective because there's there's enough to to. To vary it with and that's for his whole career that's what been what he's lacking so he he may be having a nice uh mid to late career breakout here the red sox one through five in their lineup each had two or more hits and just like that alex verdugo is on fire he has 11 hits including two home runs over his last six games the cardinals they blew up for 12 runs on monday paul de young more like paul de double dong because he hit two home runs, including a grand slam. Tommy Edmond, very quietly off to a great start this year, went two for five, hit his second home run. He is batting 294. He also has three steals on the season. How did the Cardinals score all, the, all these runs? Well, it was a Joe Ross regression game. Four and a third innings pitched, eight hits, 10 earned, three walks. The ERA now up to 5.87. Hope you didn't pick him up in a points league and use him as a spark like Adam Azer and I did. This week in the podcast league, so not great, Bob. Uh, is this an auto drop for Joe Ross? Yeah, I'm fine with it. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I was skeptical in the first place. This kind of confirms my skepticism. If the Joe Ross advocate Chris Towers is okay dropping him, then you should be okay dropping Joe Ross. Jack Flaherty, six innings pitch, six hits, five runs. Two of those were earned. Uh, five strikeouts, only eight whiffs on 107 pitches. Anything to see here with Jack Flaherty? I, I feel like he's been pretty underwhelming so far this year, and the velocity is down. It's been down between one and one and a half miles per hour basically every start. So 
I'm not panicked about Jack Flaherty, but I'm a little concerned. I'm a little concerned yeah, no, he's, he's not going to deliver that ace outcome. He's getting hit hard. His uh, his curveball, especially, has gotten hit really hard. That hasn't been a good pitch for him so far this season. But well, he's you know, mostly just thrown fastballs and sliders. I know the last two starts, it's you know, yeah, his curveball usage rate is twelve percent. Actually, yeah, his yeah. overall usage rate is his fastball usage rate is up. That's the biggest thing. Um, yeah, and historically, that's not a great thing for him because his fastball does tend to get hit harder than everything else. But yeah, no, I agree. He's been certainly underwhelming so far. Somebody offered me Nolan Arenado for Jack Flaherty in a 15 team Roto league where I desperately need every hitting category, not called steals. Would you guys, <laughs> would you guys accept that trade? Would you take Arenado for Jack Flaherty? I mean, it would depend how much pitching depth I had because that's still going to be difficult to replace, I think, especially after some of these early, these Johnny come latelys. Some of them are going to wash out, obviously. Well, um, Scott, I have this team open right now. So I will let you know that I have Trevor Bauer, Jordan Montgomery, Aaron Savale, Dane Dunning, Michael Fulmer, Chris Paddock, Carlos Rodon, and Mike Soroka on the IL. So no, no, you do not have the depth. To no. <laughs> Fifteen team league. What are you gonna do? <laughs> I think you gotta hold on to. I mean, you can't count on anything from Paddock at this point, right? So I, I like, I, if you did it, I think it would be fine. Yeah, um, it's a, it's probably a fair deal, but I'm, I'm trying to sell high on like Savale or Rodon instead, but no one's biting because they're smart, smart players. Uh, Kevin Gosman was at the Philadelphia Phillies on Monday. Six shutout. Six hits, four walks, five strikeouts, 14 whiffs on 108 pitches. Fine. The fastball velocity, however, 93.4 miles per hour in this start. It was 94.5 entering this start, and it was 95.1 last season. So any cause for concern with Kevin Gosman, although he was good. Yeah, he gave up eight hard hit balls in this one. He walked four. The, the, Kind of seems like a got lucky, had good sequencing luck kind of thing, but I, I remain pretty un, unconvinced about Kevin Gosman. Um, and so, if someone saw his pretty two point four five ERA and wanted to to trade for him, I, I would be happy to do that. Would you trade him for Charlie Morton if you could, Chris? Oh my God, yes. How about for yes. Jesus Lazardo? Yeah. How about Ian Anderson? Oh, yeah. How about Zach Plesak? Yeah, I'd rather have Plesak. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> wow. Chris it's, choosing to having to choose between two players he has no taste for. Yeah. So the thing about Gosman, I mean, historically, he's going to get better as the season goes on. It's kind of amazing looking at his month by month career breakdown, how like every month gets better. I did want to, what was I going to say about uh, Zach Plesak? Tough two-start week this week, so it's going to be a nice test for him. He's going up against the White Sox and the Yankees, although the Yankees are not hitting anybody right now, so maybe it's not so so rough. Um, again, yeah, Zach Plesak, tough matchup. I wanted to do the some bullpen updates, but there's currently games going on right now. Uh, Josh Hader is in in the bottom of the ninth in a 3-1 to -one game against the Padres, Ian Kennedy has first and third. Yeah, he's, he's trying to blow this one. He is trying his best. He has a two-run lead against the Angels. The only other bullpen situation I noticed on Monday, Wandy Peralta picked up a save for the Giants with Jake McGee on the COVID IL. To stream or not to stream. And I think what we need to do from now on is we do it for the day of and for the next day. So we'll just try to help everybody out. To stream or not to stream for Tuesday. Would you guys actually start Chris Paddock versus the Brewers? I'd really no. rather not. Even with no Christian Yelich? And, but like, yeah, the thing is like compared to the other guys we're talking about on these two lists, he's going to be pretty high up. So uh, yeah, I'll have to true. remind, I'll have to remind myself that I'm judging him by that standard. So yes, I would stream Chris Paddock. He's not, I mean, it's, it's okay to say no to everybody, right? Yeah, it's all right. It, I don't know. You know. I mean, part of part of the problem is I don't really know how to calibrate this because anyway, let's just Scott, do it. Scott has the best this picture. Not, this is not my favorite part of the show. <laughs> yeah, there are people who love this this segment, so we've, we've uh, got to help. So, so you tell me. 
Uh, Shohei Otani versus the Texas Rangers. Would you use him as a hitter or a pitcher? Hitter. Hitter. Fair enough. Uh, Matt Shoemaker at the Oakland A's. No. I'd rather start Paddock. Tyler Anderson at the Tigers. I'd rather start Paddock. Ian Kennedy got the save. Michael Fulmer versus the Pirates. I'd I might take him over Paddock. Oh, you, you said you'd rather start Paddock. Okay. Yeah. I would rather start Paddock, but I will start both. I like yeah. Michael Fulmer against the Pirates. Adam Wainwright at the Nationals. Nah. Nah. Logan <laughs> Webb at the Phillies. Nah. Yeah. I'm not sure how deep they'll let him go after he's <clears throat> missed his last term, basically. Taiwan Walker at the Cubs. Um, it's okay. I'd put yeah. I'd put Fulmer and Paddock ahead of him. Jake Arrieta on the other side versus the Mets. No. Nah. Brad Keller versus Tampa Bay. That's pretty good. Yeah, maybe. Pretty They're off. <laughs> Their offense is brutal right now. <laughs> we have such tepid responses. All yeah, right. it's uh, give me a yes or no, guys. Do, do, do we it. ever? Do we ever like say yes with gusto? You have to start this guy. No, it's always I mean, either I'm nah not, or eh. <laughs> I'm not asking about Shane Bieber. <laughs> uh, Luis Garcia yeah. at the Rockies. Uh, no, only as a spark. John Gray <laughs> versus the Astros on the other side. No. Jordan Lyles at the Angels. Nope. Matt Harvey at the Marlins. Come on. <laughs> no. So I'm not even going to ask about the last name on this list. Uh, if you are looking to add a pitcher and stream them the next day for Wednesday, would you... All right, these guys are not free agents. I get that. But people might actually be scared to start them. Would you start either of Corey Kluber or Ian Anderson who face each other? Oh, I would start Anderson. I wouldn't, I wouldn't start Kluber. No, if I could help it. Got it. Kluber... Cooper took some steps in the right direction in his last start. The velocity was up. He got a lot of whiffs. Um, I, I don't think all hope is lost there, but I'm not ready to activate him yet. Yeah, I, I don't... Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's a little take lock, but I don't really... I'm not sitting in Anderson yet at all. I, yeah, you probably don't need to against the Yankees right now, the way that they're playing. And he dominated them last year in his first career start. Anthony DiScalfani at the Phillies for Wednesday. Maybe it's a, okay. Bruce Zimmerman at the Marlins. Nah, no, no Starling Marte. I kind of like it. It's sneaky. Come on, Frank, they have to be a decent pitcher. Uh, yeah, all right. Uh, Jay Hab <laughs> at the Oakland A's. I would uh, rather not. Yeah, no, let's not do that. Carlos Martinez at the Nationals. Nope. Mike Fulton at the Angels. Nope. nope. Jose Quintana versus the Rangers. He's nope. been so bad. I, I can't. No, let's not do that. Adrian Hauser at the Padres. No. Merrill Kelly at the Reds. Mm -mm. Mitch Keller at the Tigers. It's not a definite no. I don't think it's, <laughs> it's a yes. Great, we'll go with in deeper leagues. Spencer Turnbull making his season debut against the Pirates. No. <sighs> I mean, streaming a pitcher. Oh. In deeper leagues is probably a bad idea anyway. Um, I guess you might have to in a points league, but in a categories league, if you're rather than stream a starter, start a reliever, right? I guess. I mean, if you do want to stream a pitcher, it's going to be against the Tigers or Pirates, right? Those are oh, there's there's an exciting one coming up. Let's keep going. There's an exciting one coming up. Oh, it's got to be David Peterson at the Cubs. No, it's got to be Zach Davies against the Mets. I, I don't hate that actually, but. Um, better better off not doing that. All right, well, no way it's Jake Junis versus the Rays, is it? It is! Ah! Jake Junis! He's kind of interesting, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's wrap up with some team name Tuesday. we got a lot. From Michael, Enoa, what you did last summer. Yep. From Joseph, sexy and Enoa it. Yep. This one is from, I think it's also from Joseph. K's, 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 it's magic. Enoa. If you, I mean, have, yeah, just we'll move, yeah, we'll move past it. All right. If you have and Enoa, it clap your hands. Yep. <laughs> I like that. Chris just says, "Yep." Uh, <laughs> Enoa, right. Enoa, love you, but I'm playing for peeps. 
Uh, yeah. This one was for you, apparently, Chris. It, I don't, is it a Genesis song or something? Is that what that is? I, I don't I don't recognize it. All right. Th these are from apparently I've been miscast. Uh from Kaz. Tati's too bad for you. Al's the big Genesis guy. Yeah, I don't get that one. Me neither. This one going Soto. Oh, yeah, sure. Lee <laughs> Bieber. I love Chris's yeah. reactions. Uh, from Jack Boyce, Yabba Dabba Doo. Oh, yeah. yeah. From Daniel, the Trevor ending story. Oh, da -na 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 -na. Classic. It's a classic team name right there. Turn around. From Tim, my girl okay, wants to. Yeah. Oh, this is good. From Tim. My girl wants to Marte all the time. Marte all the time. That's a good one. I love it. <laughs> and last but not least, from Justin, Dexy's Midnight Runners in Scoring Position. Fantastic. That is really good. I had no idea what it was until I looked it up. Rule 5 Rejects. I don't... I, don't, I, I feel like it's something, but I can't get it. Last but not least, Fully Torqued. Sure. All right. For Scott and Chris, I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching a great rendition of Team Name Tuesday. We'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.